Hello and welcome everyone to the uh, session for the RESI conference called PropTech, Land PropTech Landscape. Um, I'm delighted to be here. My name is Justin Harley from Yardi. I'm the director of the residential business and I've got with me James Deersley. Hello James, how are you? Hey Justin, and, well, and I love the fact we've got a dog joining us as well. I don't know if you, anyone can uh, see the fact that on our screen. We've I, got a dog I think every meeting should have a dog. Every <laughs> should have a dog. Honestly, you'll get a lot of sense out of it, which is great. So, um, Yardi, we're very keen to uh, bring this session. And actually, uh, I mean, you're, you're world famous, James, uh, in terms of your knowledge of uh, prop tech and uh, one of the kind of foremost commentators on the subject. So it's brilliant to have you here. And I think one of the reasons that Yardi wanted to kind of get you involved was to kind of, you know, we, we're kind of one of the pioneers of prop tech. You know, Yardi's 35 years. We started in the garage writing systems for residential property. And, um, and over, the, over the years, we have technology that now manages in excess of 14 million uh, residential units. So, and we continue to innovate and love to hear what other people are doing and uh, still truly believe there is so much scope and room for improvement. So James, it's great to have you on board and uh, I look forward to you sharing the landscape with us and with all the viewers. So James, over to you. Thanks Justin, cheers for that. And uh, you know, it's very flattering, but you know, ultimately I'm just, I've just been around here talking about prop tech the longest. So I think that's all, all, it, is, all it really is for, from my perspective, but, uh, but no, we're certainly into a, into a really fascinating um, field at the moment and I and I hope really my, my objective here from a um, from sort of presenting some information to you all is just a, a bit of a learning landscape and actually understanding you know the likes of Yardi why they're so important to our industry and why you know for example the established companies like Yardi who really are iconic and have sort of defined the landscape that we're in uh, are so important for all of you here to understand so what I want to do is actually just jump into a shared screen all right great so like what I want to try and do is set up the scene really prop tech talking about it <clears throat> perspective a European perspective and, and ultimately a local sort of UK centric approach and that's really what I want to try and do here today which is just give you an introduction as to what PropTech actually is sounds stupid but I think we need to have a base level understanding because yeah. a lot of people don't realize really what it is um, and then really sort of just give you an idea as to where we are at the minute in terms of the sort of the, the funding aspect of where the the money markets think it's going and then actually looking at it from an industry residential focus in terms of where the actual industry is taking it and that's really where I'm going to sort of finish this and hopefully it'll lead into a great discussion between Justin and I in terms of what we feel it, uh, is sort of important in this sector. So without further ado really um, from my perspective here firstly and foremost it's an understanding of what PropTech is and what it isn't. Um, it's one small part of the wider digital transformation of the property industry. You know to be honest PropTech is just a little crappy term, which is a marketing term. Um, it was actually born about, about sort of seven or eight years ago when some of us were so fed up with the American market calling it retech or real estate technology. And we just felt that no one really understood what real estate was. And we wanted to talk about PropTech, but it's a marketing term. What really we're seeing is this move to a digital transformation. And every other industry under the sun has pretty much gone through this process. And we're one of the last. And really an important aspect here is it's not about a technology driven innovation it's actually here about the mentality shift that we're going through you know we've had this technology shift for years but what we haven't really got around to is this understanding of what technology will do for us as a sector and the mentality shift in both the consumers that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis but equally us as employees or employers of the real estate industry and understanding the technology um, side from that respect and then lastly, um, it was Andrew Baum, Professor Andrew Baum and I who came up with this sort of several years ago now. We finished off with saying it's about the data assembly, the transaction and really the design in those buildings, but also of the cities. So understanding that this isn't just about a single residential property in Manchester. This is about entire city infrastructures which are changing. And that's becoming more and more important as we're starting to see in these recent times, this movement away from the cities, especially from a resi focus and actually it's giving our cities an opportunity now to press the reset button and say, actually, what opportunities are here, given COVID is pushing people outwards, what can we do in cities to make them more attractive? It's a really interesting, I think, a pinnacle point in time uh, with city development using technology at the heart. Moving forward, back actually in 2017, there was a really simplistic approach to what sort of this 
property and this technology movement was all about. And it was sort of in part financial technology, in part property technology, the symbiosis of it in the middle with a little bit about this sort of gig and shared economy in a bit and smart real estate, so sort of IoT and everything there. It was too simplistic, it didn't make any sense because the property market is much broader than that. So you've got to sort of look at it and saying, well, actually now it's not. There is an element of this symbiosis between financial and prop. And we are seeing that more and more in these current times where there is um, a natural sort of affinity with the banks wanting to innovate and the property companies wanting to do so as well. But you've also got the construction market. So this sort of area around construction technology is having an impact. But then you've got all these little tiny ancillary markets like your health technology, your environment tech, your energy tech, your legal tech, mortgage tech, retail tech, and so on and so on and so on and so on, which all, because the property market is so broad, have an impact on our sector. And so, you know, people have got to just realize that it's not just about our residential buildings. So to give you some facts and some figures, you know, there are 8,000 plus prop tech businesses that us here at Unis who are analyzing. That is our job. We are a repository for all of these solutions. And we sort of help people understand, you know, should we be using a, a Yardi or should we be using a virtual reality solution? That's what we're doing. We're analyzing 8,000 and over three and a half thousand of those are based um, over here in, in the European market. And actually really the UK leads the way um, in, uh, in the European market with the likes of sort of Germany at 340, France 530, and sort of second and third place in Spain is obviously um, sort of in the middle of there as well. So there's real pockets of innovation. Um, UK really leads around the sort of business to consumer marketplace. The Nordics really rule around construction. The sort of the Dutch and the Germans are around sustainability and energy technology. So there are lots of little hubs depending on your interests um, in this marketplace. Sort of in terms of city by city analysis, London is the center of prop tech in the world. Much like the FinTech center, it is also the prop tech center. It's not led, funnily enough, by the Americans who started the whole charge. It's actually led by ourselves. But let's actually look at some of the technologies which are really impacting our sector. So sort of from 2018 beforehand, that sort of decade before, really the data analytics and big data were, were quite prevalent. All right. So um, that is sort of looking at the underlying infrastructure of our buildings and the data that's coming from them was, was definitely important. And the, really the firms were there to help you analyze data. But actually, it's only when you go to the last two years where still data analytics and big data were still quite prevalent. But it was only in the last two years that we started to see this bias towards the Internet of Things, smart homes, smart buildings that are really starting to be the providers of the data for the companies to start to analyze. So almost the data companies were there before the data was really and truly massively available on a grand scale. And you can start to see, you know, Internet of Things at nearly for the 14 percent up from nine smart homes, smart buildings at threes and fours now at eight percent. And really the variety has dropped um, in the sense that there were many lots of different technologies which are happening in the last 10 years. It's got an awful lot more refined around certain core technologies. And you've got the likes of. AI, for example. So data analytics and artificial intelligence are sort of, again, quite symbiotic in the way that they do with their, their dealings. And it, you know, AI wasn't really a powerful force 10 years ago, uh, but now it's really prevalent. So hopefully some insights there around the infrastructure and the data that feeds the infrastructure that's, uh, that's pulling in. Just from a funding perspective, funding has massively dropped off this year, as you might expect. We think um, in Europe in particular, it'll be at about pre sort of 2014 levels, but globally, um, it'll be about just sort of 2016 was the last time it hit that sort of um, nearly 10 billion mark. We reckon we'll get near near there, but it's the deal volumes that have dropped off massively. Now, what that does mean, however, is whilst the impact in terms of the money markets and the venture capitalists who are investing have dropped, the maturity of the sector is massively rising because it's the deal volumes have dropped. So the young startup companies have been impacted but the larger, more established companies are getting much more mature. They've got established business models. They're impacting the sector and they're getting the money to fuel that growth and fuel that scale. So expect much more maturity as we go. So let's just look at this as a sort of a summary, really, for me. And this is the important bit, which I hope Justin and I will go into a little bit later in the fireside chat, because there's a massive difference between the money makers in terms of the venture capital funds. And there's a lot of sort of negativity around, well, technology markets are just fueled by money. And they are, but at the moment, it's all around infrastructure. So what underpins the, the property market, the building information systems, the 
um, the digital twin structures of what buildings look like in a digital environment. Um, and, and things like that are really sort of this infrastructure development. They're getting a load of money. But the industry trend is somewhat different. From a residential focus, they are really looking at this emotional trend that the consumers are giving. Now, there are three core areas that I look at here. Number one is the consumers are demanding of transparency and certainty in their market. Now, what do I mean by that? Now, whether I agree with these business models or not, what we're seeing is this emotional trend of consumers wanting this in their sort of companies or agents that they're working with. And so, you know, we're seeing a lot of movement, especially over in the States, for example, really well-funded eye-buying companies. Now, personally, I don't like them. All right, I buy as being that they will buy slightly under market value, they'll put some money into the companies and they'll resell, resell them on. They're massively well funded. You've got the likes of Open Door that is about to go to a direct market listing in the States with what's called a SPAC, which is a special purpose vehicle um, enabling a direct listing. And they're getting this massive. I mean, we're talking billions of dollars of funding to buy assets cheaply and then sell on quickly. But what it's doing is it's giving people certainty. They don't have to go into a chain. They don't have to worry. They're actually getting a definite price and they're selling. Now, that's basically built on a prerequisite of having auto valuation models, which are using technology to basically um, say, well, that property is worth that much. And it works in some sort of, you can imagine in the Manchester's and the London's and the Liverpool's where you know the residential streets and you know that a two bed flat goes for that sort of price. And it works in some of the American cities, but it doesn't work everywhere. But it's not whether it works or not, it's about the emotional development of your clients are wanting transparency and certainty. How can we deliver that as an industry is something that we need to question. Affordability is the second angle that we're seeing this emotional push. And we've got, you know, this is a global thing. And this is especially apparent. And we've got the banks struggling with this at the minute as much as us as an industry, which is how do we create the property market to be more affordable? And that's affordable in two ways. That is, how do we make our rentals um, a much better marketplace? How do we give security to our renters? Um, how do we inspire our renters to make it more affordable to them to rent? And so things like credit um, scoring for rentals with their rental um, uh, payments every single month and adding that to credit scores. Things like, um, rather than the old traditional sort of five or six week deposit, how do we make that into insurance back deposits? Things like incentivizing um, tenants to pay on time with sort of tenant bonuses. There's lots of companies like your credit ladders, your um, canopies, your vaboos, which are all really important aspects around that affordability angle. And then you've got this bit of how do we get more renters to buy, which is the focus of the banks and the um, estate agencies to say, let's support them when they're renting because the we want to get them into home buying. You've got companies like Way Home, which are almost sort of much larger companies where you can effectively be an owner of a property and the rent you're paying, you're actually paying off the equity in the, in the, business, in the uh, building rather than just paying a landlord. There's lots of interesting affordability models out there which, we, which may well have an impact. And the last thing to look at is this emotional development around self-service and control. Putting the, uh, the vendor, in this case, let's say on the buyer side, uh, the vendor actually in charge of the selling of the property. So you have got the, you know, the purple bricks et al of the world, which many people hate and dislike. But again, they give some level of certainty around fees. So they sort of speak to that transparency and certainty level. But also they're putting the onus of the sale in the hands of the consumer. So you can pick your, you can pick your floor plan. You can pick the right photo. You're in charge of putting the description which goes on the search engines. You're in charge of this, you're in charge of that. If you want to do the viewings, you do the viewings. It's this aspect of emotional control that you're giving those potential vendors, which means that they feel partly responsible for whether something sells or whether it doesn't. Now, again, I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just telling you what we're seeing is this industry trend around what the consumers are demanding of the industry. And there may be technology suppliers that you might want to focus on. So without further ado, that's my little bit. Thank you. If you want to go and have a look at Unisu with all our different suppliers um, from both sides of the market on there, you can do. Uh, but without further ado, that's me stopping talking and waffling on. And Justin, I hope that that was interesting. There you go. James, fantastic. And, and a great, very fast journey uh, of prop tech and the landscape. And, and thank you so much uh, for sharing that with us. Um, I actually have a couple of questions, if that's all right. Um, so the, the, it was, I was fascinated at the beginning where you, um, you mentioned that PropTech was a mentality. Um, it's something that I 
I personally agree with um, uh, massively. Um, and I think one of the challenges that we see on technology is uh, customers having the right mentality to uh, adopt uh, prop tech in, in whatever form or whatever problems they're trying to solve. How would you say a business should go about addressing prop tech? Because it can be quite daunting, as you say, you know, looking at the number of providers and there are so many different areas. How would you suggest if I was running, say, a residential real estate business, I go about looking at the prop tech world and learning more? Yeah, and, and that's probably the, one of the most difficult things that the, in, the entire global industry is wrestling with, really, um, because technology for technology's sake is just a complete and utter waste yeah. of time. Um, you know, and why bother with it? And I think we see so many mistakes made by senior leaders of real estate companies where they, they, there's two mistakes they're making at the minute, which is number one, they're just going, oh my God, we need to get a technology solution in place and we need to get it now. You go and do it, right? And it's not really thought through. It's just a panic reaction to all of this, you know, I was going to call it bullshit, but I was going to say that that's probably not the right thing to do on a, on a call. But all of this sort of hype around technology, which isn't necessarily right. You don't, you don't just need to go out and get anything of technology because it's the wrong way of doing it. Yeah. So that's the first mistake they're making. Just go and get some technology because then we're all okay. The second thing and the second mistake that I'm seeing some of these um, uh, industry and, and companies making is the mistake of not doing anything. Yeah. And there's this fear of failure that we're seeing, which is let's not do it because it is all hype. Let's not just think about it. We'll just park it for a bit and we'll see how it all goes. And, and that mistake is what I call the legacy mistake, which is in a lot of cases, and I, and I don't mean to, um, to be controversial too much here, but in a lot of, the, especially the larger um, companies that we're seeing uh, globally, the sort of the, the global boards, the C-suite levels, they are generally slightly older in demographic. They have come up generally from the property market. They might have been in that company for an awful long time. They've made their own personal reputation by understanding the market intimately. Mm. Yes. So actually moving towards technology suppliers where they're ceding control of what has been traditionally a relationship driven business is very difficult for them to understand, put in place, and they're scared of the legacy that if it all goes wrong. And I think that actually the bigger mistake is the mistake of not doing anything. And I often use like a football mentality here, which is, you know, it's like um, when a manager leaves a club and they're not thinking about succession. It's exactly the same. Alex Ferguson at Man United, when he left, it all just went you know, and it didn't really carry on. It's Quite pleasing, isn't it, really? Very pleasing. <laughs> Yeah, well, it was for me. <laughs> but, but, that, but that's, that's the biggest challenge, actually. And I think it's the challenge of, of not doing anything. And so I think the first thing that really any leader needs to do within um, any of these organizations, and the first thing they should be doing, is bringing together groups within the company. And it's not the C-suite. That's a great idea. Great idea. Level, medium level, and right at the grassroots. And We've actually, it's quite interesting, back when I was a consultant, we used to do quite a lot of work with this. And we just said, you know, I want you to not only bring in your boards of directors, but take the commercial world for a second. It could actually be in the resi as well. You know, if there is a receptionist that's working with you on the front desk of your estate agency, and he or she sees those people every day coming into the office, and they're the first point of contact with your customers, you know, in the, in the commercial world, it's different to the high street. But you want to get those in because they will have as many ideas as the people that are dealing with the transactions on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. And you need that as a sort of almost like a, um, a sort of a, a board of people looking at the future of the company. And it's not about yeah. the next month. It's about the next five years. Yeah. Where are we? You it's know, like your digital board. Yeah, it is. But I like that. that's from an internal perspective. But then my, mm. my other bit of advice for anybody looking at this and saying, well, what do we do? Because we don't really understand it is to say, well, have you ever spoken to your customers? And I'm not just talking about the customers yeah, yeah. in terms of the people buying a home. I'm talking about the people who you know, you've dealt with over the last sort of three or four years. Go back to them and just say, look, we don't want to sell you a house, but we just want to understand you know, what's the route. You know, if you were to do it tomorrow, what would you do? What are you expecting from an estate agent? And you may hear things you don't want to hear. You know, quite often we get a lot of people saying, well, actually what I want an estate agent to do is to open the door. Yes, yes. Exactly right. And actually, it's interesting. And I think you're spot on, James. I think that's absolutely right in that, you know, one of the things that we see very often is 
quite complex requests for technology, uh, tender requests, um, that actually are trying to automate the current processes. Yeah. In Instead of actually saying, hold on a minute, what can technology really do to make sure that we don't need to do that anymore? There's a new way of doing it. There's a new experience for our customers. But actually, if we shifted our mindset, uh, if we had that digital board um, and there was a mindset shift, then actually we could probably look at the options that we've got with various technologies that are available today, rather than trying to just repeat what currently is in existence because it kind of works. And um, so I think, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that comes down to um, uh, the vision. Now, um, I'm conscious of time here, so I'm going to ask you one last question. So if you, um, if you were to give people in residential real estate, um, maybe three, three or two, whatever, whatever you feel comfortable, uh, top tips of how to get the most from PropTech, what would they be? Uh, so uh, two actually really clear ones. Um, number one, to finish that uh, sort of discussion beforehand is just talk to customers. You know, there, there seems to be this, actually, no, I'm going to give you three. Talk to customers because, and you shouldn't be afraid of doing that. They are going to be more insightful than, than anybody. And by the way, when you're talking to customers, don't ask them what they want. Okay, because if you ask them what they want, they're not going to tell, they, they, may, they may not even know what they want from an estate yeah. agent. What you want to do is you want to ask them what they do. What are you going to do when you look to buy a house? What are you going to do when you look to rent a house? What is your process in which to do that? Because if you understand how that customer is going to do that job, let's call it, um, you will understand where you fit in that process. If you ask them what they want, they probably don't know what they want of an estate agent. Ask them what they do. It's a massive customer difference. So that's the first thing. Speak to as many people, as many customers as you want, uh, as you can. That's the first thing. The second thing um, is don't be afraid to screw it up. Um, and so many people, and, and this is actually the worst people at this are the legal um, companies because they feel as if they have a, uh, you know, they, they should be the, the, the authority above everything else. And the legal technology um, companies are starting to help the legal teams understand. So the big legal firms in, in, you know, sort of big cities are now realizing that actually if you bring their customers on the journey and they say we're trialing technology we're going to you know we're going to work with some and we're, we're doing it in a startup mentality which is um uh, you know really it could work it might not work but we're going to sort of you know try quickly and if we fail we fail but we're going to communicate with you but this is all about us changing the way that we work so that's the second thing i would definitely say is you know, really and truly just don't be afraid to fail. And that is something which is, it, it's a mentality shift, which again, from the top down into the bottom of, that, of the organization, getting that message across to your staff, which is we are changing, we are evolving, and we're going to be trying things. Mm -hmm. We need your feedback as to whether they're working or whether they're not working. And don't just say to me tomorrow they don't work. I mean, I was there with Foxton's and it took us about 18 months to bring in all of the systems back in sort of the early 2000s, which still keep Foxton's running now. Yeah. I remember it was an 18 month shift that was, but you must bring all of your, your team with you. And the third thing really is, um, so when I say don't be afraid to, to screw it up, the other bit is just get out there and speak to these technology companies. You know, there are so many, I think I said there was 946 in the UK, obviously they're not all resi, but go and talk to them. You're gonna have some enlightening conversations with some really keen entrepreneurs and some of them just won't get it. Right? Some of them don't come from a property background, sadly. But actually, they might be able to help you from a mentality shift perspective, and you might be able to help them from a property perspective. And actually, somewhere in the middle, you might come together and find something which is really fantastic. But I'm telling you now, if you're expecting it to be a finished article, it, no, it won't be. You know, the yardies of this world, Justin, you guys have nailed it for so long because you well, know what the industry wants. But there's a lot of companies who don't know, you know the property yeah. market that you do, and you've got to help them. I think ultimately, though, um, no, no matter how experienced you are and whatever investment you put in innovation, it continues to change and technology changes so fast that innovation is a constant. And, you know, at Yardi, I think one of the things that I, I love about Yardi is the investment in, in innovation and technology. You know, 15% of our turnover is put back into R&D. That's yeah. extraordinary. Um, well, but that's, that's extraordinary in the property market, I can tell you. Because it is extraordinary. 
problems that we've got. It just doesn't happen. Yeah, and, and, that, and, you know, and, that, uh, you know, that's one of the, uh, and that's exciting because we see great innovation. Uh, and I think one of the challenges is a lot of it is customer led, but it's also speaking to the people that are not customers too. Yes. Uh, the people that are not, because why aren't they customers? Where, where did we fall short? And what, do, how do we improve the experience and the journey for residents or, or the technology for residents and, and well, both commercial and, and uh, residential is the same. So very, very important part. So, so I think, James, um, I've really enjoyed this. It's been fantastic. Thank you very much. And uh, really insightful. And um, I love your enthusiasm. It's absolutely fantastic. And I hope everyone will. I think that um, uh, your three tips are absolutely fantastic. I'm just going to reiterate them, which is get out there and talk to your customers and ask them, you know, what do they want to do? What do they want to do? Uh, secondly, don't be afraid to screw up. And I so agree with that because I think, you know, uh, technology is an evolution when you implement it and you'll get things wrong. So don't be afraid to screw up. That's really, really important. And um, lastly, get out there and speak to these great prop tech companies um, because there are so many great things happening out there. Talk to them and um, see what their vision is and where they can take you. So thank you so much. And yeah, thank you. Justin, sorry, one really particular thing on that. <laughs> customers, not what they want to do, but what they're going to do when it comes to buying or renting. Thank you. What they want, they won't understand. What they, what they do to do it will help you understand where your position is. Gotcha. Yeah, the things that they do and the way they're going to do it. Yeah, perfect. Absolutely. So a big thank you to the Resi Conference for uh, having us and allowing us to uh, share this with you. I hope you've all enjoyed it. And um, I believe we're going to be doing a question and answer live. So feel free to use Zoom to chat and ask any questions if you, if you want to. James, thank you so much. Thanks, Justin.